I've mentioned the, the end times in several of my sermons of late. I, along with uh, many other people, are concerned that the end of the world, either in its totality or as we know it, is much closer than ever before. The gospel lesson from <coughs> Luke and the normal lectionary readings for today certainly allude to that possibility. And Jesus tells us that we are to be ready when the time comes, dressed for action on our lamps, lit that we're to be like servants who are waiting for their master to return from a wedding feast. And when he comes and knocks, they will open the door for him immediately. And the best part is this, that those servants who the master finds awake and ready will be very happy because, Jesus tells us, those who have waited faithfully will be rewarded and served by none other than the master himself. For those of you today who are entering the ordained ministry in Adam, who will be entering a new ministry, let me encourage you to prepare yourselves and those to whom you minister to watch and wait faithfully. I've read a lot of books lately about survival scenarios that include everything from the results of an all-out nuclear war to the use of electromagnetic waves that would, in essence, return the world in which we live to a primitive way of life that none of us could ever imagine. And the Bible speaks of many of these things as being signs of Christ's return. One of those signs is that we will live in a time of increased knowledge. The old prophet, uh, uh, Old Testament prophet Daniel related, uh, but thou, o Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the end of time. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Do you realize now that it's been less than 50 years since man landed on the moon? In 1927, Charles Lindbergh flew from New York to Paris in 33 and a half hours. <coughs> the world was astonished. Today you can make that same trip in seven hours easy. And when the Concorde was flying about half of that time. <coughs> and while that is certainly a remarkable technological accomplishment, remember that the use of intercontinental ballistic missiles could wipe off the face of the earth and civilization in a matter of hours. <coughs> Other signs of Christ's return are the constant warfare between nations and the increase in social problems throughout the world. We're told in Matthew, the 24th chapter, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes diverse places. I can't seem to remember a time in my life when there wasn't a war, or certainly the threat of war. The AIDS virus has become a worldwide problem. The pleas for donations to help feed the hungry throughout the world seem to increase each and every year. And there seems to be more earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes than ever before. Then we are told false prophets shall abound, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. And sin will increase, while love decreases. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many, the scriptures tell us, shall wax cold. Over a million abortions take place in this country. Every year, over 40 million throughout the world. Are we moving closer indeed to the time when only perfectly healthy children are allowed to live and the less perfect thrown out or placed on body farms? While humans are living longer, will the prospect of euthanasia become mandatory at some point in our society? The reason I'm describing this very dismal and wicked world to you because this is the world in which you're going to minister. What we're doing today here in this lovely church with this beautiful liturgy, with all of these wonderful people, it's 
a very small part of what ministers do. If you do your ministry as you should, you're going to be exposed to the devil's workplace. You're going to meet sickness and death face to face. You're going to build friendships among those with whom you worship that will last forever and be more valuable than silver and gold and you will be betrayed by some of those you thought with whom you could trust your very life. And you will learn firsthand what faithful watching is all about. Being a faithful watcher means that you have to be ready. So how do we prepare ourselves to be ready and become faithful watchers, especially in a world as wicked and as complex as the one in which we find ourselves? I'm going to give you four pieces of advice today, and you will probably hear this every time I ordain new men into the ministry. First of all, pray diligently. One of the greatest writers on prayer was Ian Bonds. It said that he prayed so much that he actually wore out the floorboards next to his bed. He wrote this, The success of our living ready is dependent on our giving ourselves in prayer. Prayer, you see, is the secret to spiritual success. And as a minister, you are responsible for teaching others to pray encouraging others to pray and in general being a prayer leader of those around you and without prayer on a regular more than once a day basis you will never ever be successful by the time he was 30 Millard Fuller had achieved the American dream he was worth a lot of money lived a lifestyle that showed it he drove a fancy car he lived in a big house Owned lots of land and generally enjoyed the things his money could buy. He and his wife Linda had just about everything that a young couple could want, except, except what they began to wonder. They weren't sure. All Miller and Linda did know was that they weren't happy, and so on the advice of a friend, they began praying along with other Christians. And we quickly saw, they said, that there was much more to life than the success that money can bring. We realized God had a purpose for us, and we were determined to find out just what that purpose was. And finally, they received the answer to their prayers. They believed God wanted them to start something new, something big. They believed God wanted them to start over, so they did. They sold off their businesses their big house, they gave the money away, they sold their land, their boats, their horses, their cattle. In fact, they got rid of just about everything. They continued to pray about what God was calling them to. For more than five years, they worked in various mission stations, continuing to pray. And finally, at God's prompting, Miller and Linda formed Habitat for Humanity. A worldwide group that subsidizes housing because the Fullers were able to give away everything they had and listen to God. Thousands of people go to bed at night in a safe and secure home. Prayer, said Ian Bonds, is the very breath of the soul. Let prayer be the cornerstone on which you lay your ministry. And secondly, I would advise you to live prudently, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 5.15, that we are to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise men. You see, prudence directs all of the virtues in our life. Someone once wrote, without prudence, one's life might look like a horse and chariot running away without a driver. A lot of energy, speed, and commotion, but not going in the right direction. Thomas Aquinas wrote a great deal about virtue. He said, in addition to the theological values of hope, faith, and charity, we have to live our lives according to a set of infused moral values. And those values are prudence, justice, fortitude, and difference. Those things lead us, you see, to control our passions and desires to the point of moderation. 
acquire your knowledge thoroughly and completely, it will serve you well as you instruct others. It is our belief that as Orthodox Anglicans, we ordain only godly men as priests and bishops in our church. We believe that those men represent Jesus Christ on this earth. So above all else, you must be aware of the awesome responsibility you have. And then I would say, do you love passionately? We're in this place today because of the most passionate example of love that was ever shown. Every Sunday we answer that question, what is the greatest command? Love yourself. Love God. Love your neighbor. That's the first and great command. You have to have a passionate love for what you do if your ministry is to succeed. When your office, in your office at 2 o'clock on Sunday morning, doing the bulletins because there was no one else to do them, you're there because of your passion for what you do. This fellow right here was in the hospital at 6.30 last night. I kept telling his doctors, I gotta get out of here. I've got a mass to play for tomorrow. <coughs> he could have called me and said, Look, I just can't make it. Find somebody else. The third owner is a man of passion. He's passionate about what he does, and it shows in what he does. When you have to cancel a romantic dinner date with your wife because Mary Smith is lying at death's door. You just have to do that and learn to say, I'm sorry. Nicholas Sparks, who I'm sure many of you ladies especially are familiar with, wrote this. He said, the saddest people I've ever met in my life are the ones who don't care deeply about anything at all. Passion and satisfaction, he said, go hand in hand. And without them, any happiness is only temporary. Because, you see, there's nothing to make it last. Love God completely. Love your parish family. Love what you do and don't forget by all means to love your wife. She's your partner. <coughs> and finally, I must say to you, learn to trust God. I told her Friday night, it's God's will if you're good here, so it's God's will. Walter was telling me last night, I got the job. I'm not going to have to move after all. Walter and I was saying, why do we ever doubt? Why do we, we just believe what we preach and pray about? God's going to take care of it. Why can't we just trust God completely and let Him do the work? That old proverb, Three five that says, "Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding." Is wonderful advice. Every day of your ministry will be filled with new challenges and new opportunities, and you're going to have to rely on God to point you in the right direction. You see, whatever the circumstances, our Lord will give us the grace and the wisdom to know how to handle things and just what to say. A cute story that took place many years ago. Seems that an African American preacher was in a restaurant one Sunday afternoon after church services somewhere in the deep south. He was there with his family and he had ordered a whole cooked chicken for his family to enjoy and just as it was put on the table, a mob of Ku Klux Klan members came in, all in their white uniforms. 
and they marched right over to his table and noticing the cooked chicken on the table, one of the clansmen said, whatever you do to that chicken, we're going to do to every one of you. The old preacher asked, did you say that whatever I did to this chicken, that you're going to do the same thing to every one of us? Clansman said, yes, you heard right. Well, the old preacher paused for a second. Then he lifted the chicken up in his hands and put it to his mouth and gave it a kiss. <laughs> Learn to lean on God. Trust His will for your life. Receive His guidance, His grace. Being a minister of God means that you accept the truth that God simply knows what's best for you. I get this message very often. Creighton, don't try to micromanage God. <laughs> My prayer for each one of you is that you continue to follow the path that God has laid out for you and that your hearts and minds will always be open to his will and that you will watch faithfully so that in the end we will indeed be his blessed servant. Remember the words of our Lord, how we said it.